Olá, meus irmãos, amigos. Hello, my brothers and friends. We got to one more tutorial, which is the fourth week of this volume four of the Daily Food, the series, The Ministers of the Little Covenant, was title is the the title of the book is The Promises of God. Week four speaks. Uh, has a subject, the key which opens up the book of Hebrews. So let me tell you a little bit of the history of this word, this message. It was the end of last year, 2019, and I went through a situation of physical weakness, but the Lord gave me grace, and I was able to finish my last appointment with the conference in the northeast of Brazil, and I returned to São Paulo to uh, get over from my health, but always concerned with looking God's revelation. For me, was already God already revealed to me that the book of Hebrews, it is the book that uh, speaks of God microeconomic plan. The Gospel of John were the words of Jesus especially in his, uh, in his farewell to his disciples in the Last Supper, he opened up his heart when Judas Iscariot went out to betray Jesus. And there he reviewed the high peak of God's plan of salvation. God's full salvation aims at taking us out of sin through the work of redemption on the cross and aims at justifying us through faith and to sanctify us positionally. Then the sanctification process begins and we are going through this process. That is, more of the God's holy elements are being received by us and replacing our old selves of the old creation of the old man, of our self, the soul life, and God is making us as He is more and more holier and holier, and in the end, God desires to glorify us, that is to receive us in His glory. So God prepared Christ first, opening up this door opening up this way for us. He was the first man to be received within the glory of the Father. Very good. So this high peak of the revelation of God's salvation for man, it is presented in John 14 through 17. Yet the way on our day-to-day -to, -day to get there, because our reality is different, our reality is that we still just came out of a worldly life as a sinner and God then inserted us in his church and we are beginning to learn to live a life as God's people as the kingdom people of God. How can we get there? We are still filled with failures or of shortcomings. God is holy and we fall short of his holiness we fall short of His glory. God, the Trinity, is revealing to us the intrinsic oneness of the Father and the Son. This oneness, it is something that God needs to convey to us. We are so divisive, so easily we have amities, dissensions, but God is working in us this matter of oneness. God is also working in us uh, the spiritual reality. Only God is the truth in this universe. God is working himself into us. 
because we have as Paul portrays our thoughts are vanity, are empty. God is little by little filling us up with himself, with his reality, with his truth. So in this universe only God is the truth and without this truth we are not able to be inserted in God. Also God is righteousness and we still lack in ourselves. This garment of righteousness, practicing righteousness not only objectively that Christ accomplished for us in his work, but also we need on our day to day to behave ourselves with a garment of subjective righteousness. So we have a lot to get there. In the book of Hebrews in the end of last year, I was already convinced by God that the book of Hebrews is really a book that will take us out of a miserable situation just like is revealed in Hebrews chapter 3. God took the people out of Egypt and like us, these people were, were already cultured with this world and we were already cultured in the world away from God, away from God's holiness, away from everything that God is. But these people, God with mighty hand took them out of Egypt to bring them into the good land of Canaan. They needed to go through the wilderness and the wilderness for 40 years uh, aims at uh, taking down in the wilderness all our old men, our old creation, for the new creation, that is the new man, the new creation to enter the good land of Canaan. So the book of Hebrews can portray our real situation. We were still, when we left the world, when God took us out of the world, we were still rebellious, murmuring, complaining about everything. We were still self-centered, anything that was not favorable to us, we would blame God, would rebel against God, we were disobedient, we were unbelievers in our words, but thank God, God worked and his people and the new generation became a generation that could enter the good land of Canaan. Very good. So I was convinced of that, that the book of Hebrews would be our salvation of giving us the step by step to fulfill God's eternal plan. Very good. But the book of Hebrews, it is, it, it is a very difficult book to understand. I was researching and studying the book weeks we, week after week and I could not understand it and the help that I received from many authors, many people the book of Hebrews speaks of the superiority of Christ in regards to the angels to Moses, to the Levitical priesthood, Aaron as for the angels, that is Christ is superior is superior to everything but it was still lacking something for me to unveil the book of Hebrews to help me in my day-to-day -day situation. So then I was looking a week after week, day after day. It was difficult to understand and the author itself of Hebrews, it is unknown. Some say it is Paul, that was Paul. Others say that the letter to the Hebrews it is a letter written in the environment of Paul, the environment of the writings of Paul. The, yet the style of writing was quite different, but it doesn't matter. One day we'll, we'll know who wrote it, but what is important is that God inspired someone to write this marvelous book. Then in the beginning of this year, on the first Sunday of the year, I had to be here in Sao Paulo for a meeting in Caesarea Philippi. So on Saturday I was going to Sao Paulo and on the way I was seeking the Lord. Lord, you have to open up this book of Hebrews to me. All of a sudden the Lord opened up the book of Hebrews. Almost getting to Sao Paulo, I clicked 
And then I realized that the book of Hebrews is filled with words like forever in heavens, once and for all, eternal, eternity, that is, many things are related to this matter. And then all of a sudden, I received the click, the book of Hebrews, it is a book that brings us to eternity, that is, everything that Christ did, he did it as a man, limited to time and space like you and me, he offered himself up to God as a man in time and space, he lived a human a perfect human life without shortcoming, without sin, and he offered himself to God in his death and death of the cross, and then God raised him up, when God raised him up, God received him within him. If God received him within himself and glorified him, God is not a God limited to time and space. God is a God in eternity. In Isaiah 57, it shows that our God, it is the High One, He dwells eternity. So our God is in a different dimension, not in the dimension that we are in, of time and space, everything material, of three-dimensional, three dimensional of space plus fourth dimension which is time but God is in eternity that is why when Christ did all this work as a man limited by time and space he offered himself up to God everything that he did in time he offered himself up to God by the eternal spirit this is in Hebrews chapter 9 Hebrews chapter 9, let me take a look here, Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This is the great secret to understand the book of Hebrews. So in the book of Hebrews, Christ, who was limited to time and space, while he was on, on the flesh, he offered himself up to God. Everything that he did here on earth, his redemptive work, his death on the cross, his human living, his birth, everything, his incarnation, everything was offered up to God through the eternal spirit and was inserted in God in eternity and the eternity has no beginning nor end. So we have in our three-dimensional mind, in our material physical mind, our mind, which is flat, so let us put it this way, limited by time and space, he cannot understand what is eternity. I understand the happenings, the occurrences here on earth, I always draw a timeline. Oh, in the year 22, this happened in the year 60 and something, 19 and 67 happened this. So if I draw a timeline, my mind can follow and understand it because I am in my, in my limitation of time and space. But when I speak of eternity, I cannot understand it. So God is marvelous. He provided in the Ark of the Testimony, it represents God Himself because He contains the two tablets of the law, which has the Ten Commandments, which are the testimony of God. Therefore, the Ark is the Ark of Covenant and the Ark of the Testimony. So it represents God Himself with the two cherubs on its cover, so God is eternal. He is eternal, represented by the ark. And no man, limited by time and space, 
can touch this Ark of the Covenant directly. That is why God made four circles, rings of gold, one in each corner of the Ark of the Covenant, and these rings were of gold, and of course, the ring, it is a circle, it is a circumference, it is a ring, right? So this ring is different from a straight line. In my human mind, I can understand a straight line if I am to draw a timeline, right? You can put it in point A, eternity past. At some point, in God founded the world, and then after a long time, then Christ became flesh, the birth of Christ, one more point, and then Christ died, his crucifixion, and in the end, Christ ascended to heavens, right? He was raised, and if I am to put in the end of this line, the timeline, the eternity future, if I put together these two ends, so I meet these two ends, and put it in the same point, I would have a circle, right? A ring. And within a circumference, there is no beginning nor end. Because if you're to say point A is before point B, it depends on the reference. It may be before or after, because it is a circumference, right? So when Jesus, he offered himself everything he did in timeline, he offered himself by the eternal spirit, he offered himself to God, putting everything in eternity. And when putting everything in eternity, there is no more this matter of time. Then it solves. Maybe you never thought about it. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel had to bring to to, to make offerings for their sins, had to bring animals to be slain to shed the blood of the animal as if it was his own because he had to lay his hands on the animal to identify himself between himself and the animal when the animal was slain and shed his blood it was as if he was shedding his own blood and then God would forgive his sins and he would be okay with God but then why did the blood of an animal can accomplish this work how can God accept the blood of an animal? Uh, Let me give you an example. In Revelation chapter 13, let us open our Bibles. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 tells us something very interesting and mysterious. The Bible tells us and all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slam, slain from the foundation of the world well the foundation of the world was long before Christ died uh, thousands of years afterwards or if you are to speak of the creation of the universe, it's way, way, way later. So, how come the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world? Because this Lamb was offered himself up by the eternal Spirit. Everything he accomplished in time was brought into eternity. So, it was worth it for the whole eternity. It doesn't matter the time, what, what moment in time. That is why God accepted the offerings in the Old Testament from animals, the blood of animals. Because when God looked at the blood of those animals, he was seeing the blood of Christ. Why? Because Christ offered himself later by the eternal spirit, bringing in his offer in eternity and was worth it in the past. This is a mystery. So when I realized that, I was jumping up for joy. I was even gone mad. The saints saw how I was 
kind of out of myself, out of my mind. The book of Hebrews really is helping us a lot. If you, if you look, let, let me just give you one example. If you look at the introduction of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews 1, 1, we read, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Now let me ask you, is this the Son here, the, the, the first begotten Son of God from eternity past with God? Or is this the only, the only begotten or the first begotten? was received by God as a man was glorified in God after his death and resurrection that is the son is it the only begotten or as a man received by God the firstborn if you look at the book of Hebrews as the son was offered by the eternal spirit and was and put the uh, firstborn as a man. He was raised up by God and was already brought into eternity because he offered himself up to God, everything he did by the eternal spirit. So he was brought into eternity. This firstborn son of God brought into uh, eternity was joined with the only begotten. So the son here, sometimes you cannot set apart if he's speaking of the only begotten of the Father who was with the Father in eternity past or the, the Jesus who was God said you are my son and today I have begotten you he was first born in resurrection actually these are the two aspects of him all of his complete status was there so when Christ offered himself up by the eternal spirit to God he was brought into eternity this effect was potentialized that is why he says has in the last days spoken to us by his son whom has appointed the heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds so certainly the son through whom God did the, the, the universe was the only begotten, right? But whom he has appointed heir of all things. If you were to look at the context, it is both the only begotten and the firstborn son. So anything that God came up with for the salvation of man, everything actually, it is for the son to inherit all things who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person there is no doubt only begotten and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged out sins this is the only begotten son sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they this is a secret to understand the book of Hebrews he was offered uh, to God to be able to potentialize all of that but all of that is for what? for what? another character in the book of Hebrews which is difficult to understand it is Melchizedek Melchizedek appeared to Abraham in Genesis when he returned from the victory against the four kings who had defeated the five kings and he brought Lot back he was taken captive and on his return king of Salem, king of peace and king of righteousness Melchizedek came and met Abraham with bread and wine and Abraham gave him the tithe of everything uh, he got there so the Bible always tells us that the greatest uh, blesses the smallest so Melchizedek bless Abraham so Melchizedek is superior to Abraham when Abraham gave him the tithe the tribe of Levi the Levites who later on would come also gave the tithe 
in the person of Abraham for Melchizedek. So the Levites received the tithe of the people of Israel, but in the person of Abraham he gave the tithe to Melchizedek. So who is this Melchizedek? It is a mysterious character, quite difficult to understand. So I thank God the book of Hebrews opens up to us that when Christ, he was raised by God, at the moment that he was raised by God, God said, you are my son, and today I have begotten you. He was received, the man Jesus was received within the Father, and the glory of the Father, he became the, the, only, the first begotten son of God. But at the same time, maybe this few know this, at the same time, he was appointed high priest forever in eternity, forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. After all, what is this? What is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek? In the book of Hebrews, it will explain, it explain to us that the Levitical priesthood is not perfect. It can never lead man to perfection. It was only, let us say, something temporary for what would come later, which is perfect. So when Christ died and rose up, he became the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek to, for God to have a perfect priesthood, perfect to lead us and help the people of God to lead the people of God to perfection. And this leading to perfection, it is to lead within God, to be inserted in God, in the glory of God. Why? Because to be inserted in, in God, who is holy, who is filled with glory, who is a God of genuine oneness, who is a God of truth, God who is a God of righteousness. So how can men who have no qualifications can be inserted in God. Therefore, we need a perfect priesthood to lead us, to work in us, until we get to this point of being glorified and inserted in God. That is why then God prepared the high priest in the order of Melchizedek right to lead us to perfection. Wow, what a marvelous thing. We don't have much time, but this will be developed later on in other messages. But let me finish it with Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, uh, we read, Hebrews 6, 13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. That is, when God made a promise to Abraham, actually, and this promise was already embedded the full salvation of men. The man would be worked out by a perfect priesthood until perfection. That is, until he is glorified by God, until he is inserted in God. So, it is something basically impossible in the eyes of man it is impossible how can we men to be so perfect to be inserted in God so thank God God planned in this way came up with this plan and he will fulfill it he gave this promise to Abraham but for us men it is so difficult to believe it but any man who were to make a promise to me that saying I'll give you this. I will ask for a guarantee, right? But God doesn't need. He's faithful. When God promises, He fulfills it. But this matter of the promise, it is so difficult to believe in that we mortal man sinners, man that would be one day worked to perfection, for God to work in us, not only to redeem us, forgive our sins and justify us by faith, reconcile us with God and have peace with God, 
But God is sanctifying us. God is putting His holy elements in us, His perfect elements in us, making us so much one as the one is that there is in the Trinity, filling us up with the agape love of God, bringing us into His glory, into His holiness, into His righteousness, and into His truth. And God will do that. This is in His promise. But it is so difficult for men to believe it that God then swore the sides of the promise He swore. On Hebrews 6, let me read it to you. On verse 16, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute that is between two men they make promises but also an oath an oath is a confirmation thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that is God promised and he will not change it he did not say no I could not do it no he, he promised and he will fulfill it but to give more guarantee to us he, he swore had no one greater to swear so he swore for himself verse 18 that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie we might have strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us very good the book of Hebrews then leads us to have hope but in a consistent way it's not an empty hope so Christ was already made high priest in the order of Melchizedek a perfect priesthood to lead the people of God to perfection and then God promised that this complete salvation of man and then God also swore on top of that and our soul continues unstable it continues a drifting as a, sh as a ship uh, following the, the current of the wind and the, the, the waves so our soul needs anchor thank God God gave us this promise and still this oath and, and this is a hope God gave us a set before us this hope set before us it becomes the anchor of our soul verse 19 this we hope we have an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil that is our soul today is not adrift will this happen or not happen if you were to look at your situation you sink in but then you say I'm full of failures I'm far away from that but if you believe believe in the promise of God and in the oath of God that you will have a hope firm setting the ankle of your soul in this hope and this hope is besides the veil because the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek he entered in heavens he is in the true tabernacle of God uh, as minister interceding for us working for us therefore we must live with this hope where Jesus forerunner entered for us becoming high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek therefore brothers and sisters if you still doubt it look at your condition you still think that God will not be able to, to do this work in you believe in the promise of God and also believe in the oath of God as a guarantee and we have a marvelous hope the book of Hebrews it is a book of hope you know that someone who is hopeless cannot live it's just using in a vegetative state a business owner with no hope his uh, his business will bankrupt so but we are Christians who have hope we have hope of glory we have hope that God will lead us to perfection and God is doing this work in us believe it you have a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek he is a perfect has a, pre, a perfect priesthood he offered himself up to God by the eternal spirit 
Everything he did here on earth as a man, in time and in space, he offered himself up to God and today is in eternity. God desires to bring us to his eternity, to bring us all to his glory. Praise the Lord. Be happy and filled with joy. Our God promised, he also swore. I hope that I helped you that you may raise up your head right to let it go all the discouragement let us move on God will save us completely until we are brought into God in his glory Amen Jesus is Lord